Well, good morning. It's really good to be here with all of you this morning to open up our Bibles and to learn more about God's Word. First, I want to begin by thanking Nathan for filling in uh, last week for me when I was out of town. Uh, I was able to listen to his lesson on YouTube, and I appreciate the thoughts that he brought forth. He did an excellent uh, job with that lesson. But it's really good to see everyone here this morning. We do have quite a number of visitors, and we're really glad that you've chosen to be here. Some of you may be passing through. Some of you may be here for a specific reason. But whatever it is, we are certainly glad uh, that you are with us this morning. But I'll be honest, I've been really excited about this morning's lesson. Not just because we get to finally be back in the building. I know last week was the first week for some of you, but for me, this is the first time back in a while. It's good to be back up here, not preaching in front of a screen. I'm really glad I can move around a little bit. That's helpful. But I'm really glad because this morning we're going to introduce the new theme for the year 2021. And much time, much prayer, much preparation has gone into this theme, as have the previous year's themes as well. And I'm so thankful for the elders' guidance uh, with such a theme as this as we're going to be getting into this morning. And it's my prayer that with the lessons that are going to be presented throughout the course of this year that will correspond with this theme, I hope that it will help us deepen our love for the Lord, but also deepen our love for one another and the family that we have here at Kaysville. And so the plan will be moving forward that the first Sunday morning of every month, we're going to cover a lesson that will correspond with, with the annual theme. You might be thinking, but it's December. Well, I'm going to be out of town next week, so we're going to do it a week early. And so uh, this will be our introduction to the theme. But I need you to take your Bibles out. Turn over to Matthew chapter 22, please. Matthew chapter 22. And in this passage, I want you to remember Jesus' response. Remember where the lawyer comes up to Jesus and he questions him. And asks him, which is the, the great commandment in the law? And Jesus gives an answer to that question. In Matthew chapter 22 and verses 37 through 39, Jesus answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. I think one of the greatest challenges that we have sometimes is not just to love the Lord. That's something that I think we're always mindful of, something that we have to be striving to do, to to love the Lord and understand what that looks like in our own lives and in our spiritual walks. But notice the second part of this verse. Not just to love the Lord with all that you have, but to love your neighbor as yourself. Sometimes it's hard to love other people, to love our neighbor as ourselves. And sometimes people say, well, who is my neighbor? That that question has been asked to Jesus. He answers that it's everyone. It's the people that you live with, the people inside your own home. It's the people that you randomly pass by at the store. It, It includes your actual physical neighbors right across the street. It includes also the people that you work with, the people that you worship with. A man was asked about the congregation where he worshipped and what the people were like there. To which the man replied, he said, it would be a great church if it wasn't for all the people. And you know, that's kind of humorous, but also kind of sad, isn't it? But sadly, there are some that buy into this facade. That this false reality of a spiritual world where if we got rid of all the annoyances, all the character flaws, really just all the people, then I would be able to worship God in the right frame of mind without all of their issues bringing me down. That if I just got rid of the, the, the annoyances, the, the different things that people do that get in the way, then, then I would be able to just worship God. Nothing would be interfering with me in my spiritual life. Then that would be, that would be good. But brethren, that type of spiritual world isn't meant to exist. That the church isn't supposed to be a monastery to be occupied one person at a time. A type of world where we're striving to get away from our brothers and sisters of Christ. Not at all. Read through the book of Acts and see how the New Testament church needed one another day by day. That they were with their brothers and sisters in Christ. They needed each other. And so we understand when we open up the Bible and we read the New Testament that the church, it's a family. 
It is a family of believers in whom we share fellowship, joy, trials, and worship with. And in fact, our attempts for righteousness will be incomplete. They will be incomplete until we learn to properly not just love God, but also love our fellow man. And that also includes people outside of these walls, but especially the people inside these walls. Notice 1 John chapter 4 in verse 20. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 20, John writes, If anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. It's just amazing. It's amazing that God knew how easily our disposition toward others and what we practice can so easily become twisted. That you can say you love God all you want. And that you're loving him with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. But until we show that in our actions with the people we live with, the people we worship with, and our fellow man, it doesn't really mean that much. And so this year, our theme at the Kaysville Church of Christ is to emphasize the theme of one another. We're going to stress the behaviors the, the attitudes, the conduct of our love, and also the obligations that we have to our spiritual family here, the body of Christ in Kaysville. And I think this theme will encourage us, but I'm going to warn you now, it's going to challenge you. It's going to challenge you to be the type of Christian that the New Testament calls you to be. The Bible has a lot to say about this. Fifty-eight one another commands appear in our New Testament. And so how we treat each other, how we get along with our brethren, seem to be pretty important to God, which means it better be important to me and how I am serving my brethren in Christ. You know, there were many conversations with the elders and the deacons here and their wives, and and I think there was a unanimous agreement that a theme focusing on one another was very timely, very timely. That this theme wasn't selected because the elders think that the congregation here is just at each other's throats. There's all these problems and everybody's just, you know, bashing heads. That's not the case at all. Thankfully, we enjoy a great deal of peace and unity here and a great deal of love for one another. But why this theme is so timely? Because let's face it, as we look back on 2020, it wasn't exactly the easiest year, was it? It's brought some unique challenges, some challenges that the shepherds here, us as members, that we've never faced before. We didn't think that we'd be sitting here in masks probably a year ago. Probably didn't think that would be the case. And so it's brought these new challenges that we've had to face, adjustments and change. We don't like change. And all of this has been happening. And I know we hope that, you know, 2021 is going to be here this week, Lord willing. I know we hope that next year, 2021, will get here. And when the the clock strikes midnight, everything's going to go back to a pumpkin. All the bad stuff, it's going to go away. It doesn't work like that. We've learned that's not going to be the case. Some of these challenges that we face in 2020, they're going to be with us in 2021. And so what a better theme than to emphasize one another and our dependence, not just on one another, but ultimately also on God. Brethren, God didn't put us on this earth to survive spiritually in isolation by ourselves. And so we need to learn how to grow with our family in Christ. We're going to be discussing one another. It's like, how can I bear the burdens of my spiritual family? How can I live in harmony with my brothers and sisters in Christ where we have so many different opinions about so many different topics? How can I improve on submitting to one another or showing hospitality to one another? Or do I truly understand what it means to forgive one another? These are just a few of the one another's that we are going to be discussing in this upcoming year. But as we begin looking at this yearly theme each month, what we're going to do is focus on a specific one another for every month of the year. And so for January, this one another is going to serve as a foundation, really something we're going to be building on in the upcoming months. What does it mean to be members one of another? Do you know what that means? It's taken from a passage in Romans chapter 12. 
Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5, some of you may have noticed the banners are hanging in the foyer. Some of you might be shocked and say, I didn't even notice that. Well, they're up there, and this is the verse that's on it. Kind of a verse that served as a catalyst for this theme. Romans chapter 12, verses 4 through 5. Maybe just put a marker in your Bible now. We'll come back to this a lot throughout this year. Romans 12, 4 through 5, it says, For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. So in this first lesson, we're, we're going to tackle what that means. What does it mean to be members one of another? And to expound on this concept and to make sure that we really understand it, I need you to turn over the book of 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians, and you can just stay in the first chapter for now. Because the book, in the book of Corinthians, the saints at Corinth, Paul is writing to a group. A group of saints that, simply put, they had issues. They had a lot of issues. And so Paul, in this letter to them, he has to rebuke them. He has to say some things that I couldn't imagine having to say to people. That it's very unpleasant in what he has to go about because their attitudes were wrong. Their conduct was wrong. Their approach and how they were worshiping God, that was wrong too. It's so always spends chapter after chapter trying to fix all the different issues that are arising in this congregation. And you see this in the first chapter in verse 10. I think it's a pretty a good way to summarize some of the issues that they had. Where he said, I appeal to you, brothers, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree. And that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same judgment. Paul was sick and tired of it. He didn't want any more divisions to be occurring in this group. And if you go over to the second pass, we're not going to read it. But in chapter 3, you see that division taking place, that some were following Apollos, some were following Peter. And Paul's point is, is Christ divided? Is that the way that the New Testament church is supposed to function? The way that the New Testament church, the body of Christ is supposed to look? And the answer is no, not at all. And that's why he is pleading with them to change their attitudes. And so he wanted to make sure he got his point across to them and that it was abundantly clear. And where he does a good job of expounding on this is in 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And so go ahead and turn a few chapters over there. Because in this chapter, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul uses the Greek word soma which is translated in your English Bible as the word for body. He uses that word body 14 times in this chapter. 14 times to illustrate how the human body functions, but more importantly, how that relates to the body of Christ, the spiritual body. And so he's going to draw a similarity there that I want us to see. And so we're going to do a little bit of a longer reading. Not going to read the whole chapter, but close. We're going to pick up in verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, we're going to read down through verse 26. And I know sometimes reading a long passage, sometimes the heads don't come up when you finish, but bear with me. This is an important text for us to understand. 1 Corinthians 12, beginning in verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Jews are Greeks, slaves are free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the, the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. Verse 21, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on the parts of the body that we think less honorable, we, we bestow the greater honor. 
and our, and our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, and there may be no division in the body, and that the members may all have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Did you catch Paul's message in there? Hopefully you noticed all the times that the word body is mentioned and trying to illustrate that point and how a body operates, how it's supposed to function. Paul's saying that Christians are members one of another. It's a unifying phrase showing how the body of Christ, how a group of Christians are supposed to work, how we're supposed to get along with each other. And that's why he ends this lengthy and descriptive section with, I think, a concise statement in verse 27. That's why I left off in verse 26, because in verse 27 he says, Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. We're a body. We are a team united in all that we do, which is great news, because there is power in unity. Us, the church, you know, oftentimes we use that expression referring to it as a building. But that's not how the New Testament pictures the church. The church is a body of believers. It's you, it's me, it's us, it's the individuals. We are the church. And when the church is viewed in its proper mindset, we see just how powerful it can be when every person does their part with the strength that Christ provides. For instance, have you, have you ever tried to lift a heavy box before? I'm sure all of you have, especially if you've moved. You know exactly what that's like. Here's the temptation that we have when we lift up a heavy box. What do we try and do? Naturally, we look down at it, especially us guys, and we do that. What happens? Well, either you throw your back out or you feel it the next morning. And so you learn very quickly that you can't just bend from the waist. That's not going to be helpful. Pulled my hamstring back in bed, where it hurts even now to do that. But the, what you should do, you learn, is not to bend from the waist, but you bend down low with your knees, with your legs. You activate the arms, the legs, and the back. And you know what happens? It's a lot less back aches. When the body works the way that's supposed to, it makes everything run smoothly. And the same is true with the spiritual body. When we get along with one another and we function the way that God designed the New Testament body to, to function, there's going to be a lot less backaches for us as well spiritually. And so as members one of another, we do good to each other, knowing that this is what the, what the body needs to operate efficiently. And this will make sure that the Lord is glorified. I think that's a really important thing to clarify up front about this theme. We're going to be talking a lot about our relationship with one another. And I don't ever want God to come out of that equation, that we overemphasize one another, that God somehow seems secondary, because not at all. The reason that we have a relationship with one another in the first place is because of what Christ has done for us. Because what Christ has accomplished on the Christ, he's the reason that we have this spiritual family and the blessing that it is. And so... This theme isn't about making your life more pleasant, making your life easier, that everybody just gets along. In fact, some of these lessons are going to challenge you, and I'm going to warn you, they're going to require more from you, which is hard work. But we do this not to make our lives easier, but to glorify God in this community, to make sure that he is the one receiving the glory, not me, not you, not us, but God. And so we are members of the same body, directly connected to each other. And that has some immediate implications for us. Some lessons that I want us to take home. Four quick points, and then this lesson uh, will be yours. The first that I want us to see is that all individual Christians, all individuals, we, we all have a function. We all have a role to play. We, we all contribute. We all offer something to the group. And that's what Romans 12, 4 through 5 is getting across. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not all have the same function. 
So we, though many, are one body in Christ and individually members one of another. And I I know Romans 12, that chapter contextually as it begins, is speaking about the, the different gifts that existed among the saints there. And in a miraculous sense, those gifts do not occur today. But I think the principle that Paul is speaking about here definitely does apply to us today. That we all have a function, each and every one of us, whether you're young, whether you're old, whether you're male, whether you're female, it doesn't matter. You have something that you can offer to the body of Christ. But here's the warning. If you're not adding anything, you're not doing your part, you're not contributing anything to the work here, that's a problem. Because scripture demands that you play your part. You you have a role that you need to be active in doing. Even if you think you don't have that much value. Maybe you doubt yourself and say, "What, what can I really do? I can't teach a Bible class. I can't do this. I can't do that. You still have a very important role to play in the Lord's work. Remember the parable of the talents in Matthew chapter 25. I'm not going to read it, but I put it up there as a reference, maybe to jot your memory. That there were three men in that story that were all capable of handling a certain amount of money. And that's where the word talent comes from, from that parable. A talent was a measure of money, and so each one was given a different amount of money based on their ability. And it's important to note that not everybody can handle the same amount. And so one was given five talents, another was given two, and another was given one. But did you notice that no one was given zero? Everybody has an expectation and a role that they are to fill. Well, remember in John chapter 15, as Jesus speaks about being the vine and we are the branches. But then he ends it with a warning that the branches that don't produce, the branches that don't do anything, what what good are they for? Chop her down. That's about it. Burn them in the fire. If they're not contributing, what good does that do to the vine? And that's a serious implication for us as New Testament Christians when we think about Christ being the head of this body. That's who we're ultimately connected to. And so if we aren't playing our role, it's not just an implication for us here at Kaysville, but that's ultimately something we need to consider in our standing before God. No one gets to sit the bench. Contribute nothing, sit back, and expect to ride on the coattails of nothing. That's not what we read about in the New Testament church. Ever heard of the 80-20 principle? 20-80, I forget how it is exactly. 20% of the group does 80% of the work. It's not how it should be in the Lord's work. 100% of the people doing 100% of the work. Even if you think what you're contributing is so small, what you are offering in service is just, it's limited, it's important. 1 Corinthians 12 goes out of its way to paint that picture for us. And so being members one of another means every member has a part to play in the body of Christ. Second, I wanted you to consider this, and this is a point that I borrowed from Gene Getz in his book, Building Up One Another. He, he worded it this way, that no individual Christian can function effectively in isolation. And I think this is a very timely point to make because, well, 2020. Have we, have we not learned this point That we don't do well in isolation. We don't do well when we're cut off from other people. It's unhealthy. It's unnatural. It's not the way that we're supposed to function. And so what that means is no member in the body of Christ can say to another or say to the body that I don't need you. That can't happen. 1 Corinthians 12, 21, Paul addresses that idea. This idea that some might say that that they don't need the body, that they can do it by themselves. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again, the head to the feet, I have no need of you. That means you can't, you can't operate in the Lord's body and say things like, I don't need the church. Or I don't need my brethren. Or I can do this all by myself. 
It's not the way the body is supposed to operate. In Proverbs 18, 1, a verse that won't be on the, hand, uh, on the, on the PowerPoint, Proverbs 18, uh, chat, verse 1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. The one another's that we're going over this year teach us that we aren't meant to isolate ourselves as the body of Christ. Rather, we need each other. The hand can't cut itself off from the body and say, I don't need you. Because like we said, Ephesians chapter 1 verses 22 through 23 point out that Christ is head of the body. That is the church. And so if you cut yourself off and say, I don't need my brethren. I can be alone. If I'm going to do this by myself, you're not just cutting yourself off from your brothers and sisters. You're cutting yourself off from the head. That is Christ. That's something we need to slow down and consider. Especially when we're alone, when we're isolated, it's a really easy time to be picked off. Haley thinks I'm weird, but I really like watching those nature documentaries. I love watching like planet Earth and stuff. And they get those drones high up in the sky or the helicopter looking down on how like the lions hunt in Africa. What do they do? They go after the straggler, the weak one, the one that's, you know, getting away from the pack. Don't you think that's exactly what Satan tries to do as well? Pick the weak link off, the one that is straying from its group. You know, a friend of mine was doing a four-month deployment in Iraq several years ago. And after his first uh, four months were done, he had a chance to come back to the States for just two weeks. Two weeks that, you know, just kind of calm down, spend with family, but something in that two weeks happened. He was taught the gospel and became a Christian. Just days before getting on a plane to go 8,000 miles overseas back to Iraq from his hometown. And later he would share with me that he was so scared. That he was making a huge commitment. He knew what it meant to become a Christian, but yet he was going overseas to a place where there wasn't a church. He didn't have any brothers or sisters in Christ around him. And this was long before Zoom was a thing and live streaming. He was scared. And so for that second four-month deployment, you want to know what happened? Something amazing happened. People that he had never met in his life from that congregation in Texas where he was worshiping at, people overwhelmed him for four months with phone calls, with texts, with emails, Facebook messages, whatever they could do, sending care packages over. They did everything they could to make sure that he knew he was not alone. And because of the impact that they had on him, I'm thankful for that example that they showed. But this is also what played a part in him now becoming a gospel minister, a gospel preacher. And I'm so thankful for that. But at a time where he could have easily withered away and fallen through the cracks, he was built up by his new, brand new spiritual family. People he didn't even know. His brothers and sisters in Christ. And it reminds us that we aren't meant to function in isolation by ourselves. Second John verse 12 is a powerful passage where it says, though I have much to write to you, I would rather not use paper and ink. Instead, I hope to come to you and talk face to face so that our joy may be complete. John saying paper and ink, those were just tools to get them through to the time that they could be together in person, speaking face to face. That does wonders for our soul and for our encouragement. And so we can't shut ourselves off from our family. Because if so, we become easy prey for the devil to pick us off from the pack. Third, we need to understand that no individual Christian should ever feel more important than anyone else talking about a superiority complex. Those that elevate themselves, put themselves up on a pedestal. And this can happen for a number of reasons. Maybe because of where we live or what we have. Maybe it's because of what our background may be. Maybe for us as Christians, it's because of what our Bible knowledge may be. Or like the Pharisees, like we talked about a couple weeks ago, maybe it's because of how righteous we are compared to others. 
All of those are shallow reasons, but they feel an unhealthy uh, complex that cannot exist among the body of Christ. Romans 12 and verse 3, Paul warns that. That very thing from happening, especially in that context of spiritual gifts, you know, where somebody gets the gift of tongues and all of a sudden they think they're better than somebody who has prophecy. And so he warns, Romans 12 verse 3, For the grace given to me, I say, every, say to everyone among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Nobody is more important than anyone else. Though others may have more responsibility, though others may be blessed with more ability in what they do, that does not mean that they are more important than anybody else. It seems as if you were to go back and read 1 Corinthians chapter 12, read that whole chapter, you'd see that Paul is making that same point in that chapter. In fact, verses 22 through 25, he points out that everybody's equal in the sight of God. Even though in man's sight, we may overlook the part that, you know, doesn't get the limelight, doesn't get all the attention. That's the one that man and also God places the greater honor on. The people working behind the scenes. And, you know, we, we tend to notice. We tend to highlight the song leaders. The people that teach Bible class, the preacher, the different things like that, they're visible. They're visible parts as it relates to the body of Christ, especially in the context of worship. You know, I, I get to preach before you on Sundays. I'm blessed to do that as an evangelist. I get to teach class on Wednesdays. I get to do these different things. But does that mean I'm more important? Not at all. And shame on me, shame on you, shame on anyone who puffs themselves up or puts themselves on a pedestal because of the role that they're playing. doesn't make anybody more important in the kingdom of God. There are a great number of people, especially here at Kaysville, that are doing so many things, especially behind the scenes, to help this body function the way that God designed it to. And even though you may not get a shout out during the announcements, although people may not know and post your picture on Facebook and Instagram, God knows what you're doing, and God bless you for that. And lastly, we'll end with this. All individual Christians, all Christians must work hard at creating and keeping unity. Last week when Haley and I were in Alabama at a wedding, uh, the mother of the, of, the groom, of the bride, she said, it takes a village takes a village to raise a child. And I think we all know the meaning of that quote. That parents rely on a large number of people over the years to help raise their child. But you know, the same principle is true when it comes to the local church. Elders can do a lot to help promote unity and do everything they can to make sure that everybody gets along and that everybody understands their role and their function. The preacher can help with that, but... At the end of the day, it takes everybody. It takes everybody getting on the same page and cooperating with one another. Galatians 5 and verse 9 speaks to this principle that a little leaven leavens the whole lump. That all it takes is one proud member. All it takes is one member who becomes selfish in imposing their will on others. One person that allows their opinion to dominate everybody around them. That one person, a little bit of leaven, leavens the whole lump. And so that means that each and every single one of us here at Kaysville, we have to work hard at, I, wouldn't, I think we have unity, so maybe not creating it, but keeping unity. We have to work hard at keeping it that way. Romans 9, 14 and verse 19, So then let us pursue what makes for peace and for mutual upbuilding. Ephesians 4 and verse 3, that we have to be eager to maintain the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace. These are passages that speak to all of us as Christians, not just those, uh, the elders or the deacons or the preacher. All of us have to have this attitude that we are eager to maintain unity here at Kaysville. Even if that means making sacrifices. 
course, I'm not talking about sacrificing doctrinal things and bringing in new ideas that are outside of the Word of God. Of course not. We know that. But it does mean that we make sacrifices of my wants, my desires, and even my liberties. Because that's what it means to be members one of another. When a couple's first married, what happens? They, they enjoy a honeymoon, typically, is what happens. But you know what happens when the honeymoon ends? You get back home, you get back to the apartment, wherever they're living, and reality sets in. The bills are waiting, the busy schedules, work, uh, everything else. Life crashes down, and the honeymoon ends so quickly. And if they allow all those exterior circumstances to take over, the honeymoon is gone. And so they have to work. They have to work hard at keeping the honeymoon alive. And the same thing that will destroy a marriage can destroy a congregation. A lack of attentiveness. Taking each other for granted. Selfishness. Failing to live up to one's responsibilities. And the list goes on and on and on. And so we can't be naive. Good marriages, but also good churches, don't happen on accident. They happen when each and every person involved in them is committed to keeping it working. And so even when we face opposition, we need to band together, that we can have an attitude that was said of the people in Nehemiah's time, where he said, so we built the wall, and the wall was joined together, the half its height, for the people had a mind to work. And so are you ready to get the work on this this year? Committing ourselves to service to, of our Lord, but also to one another. Working on our relationships, being the body that the New Testament paints for us. That can be said of us here at Kaysville. Now one thing that I think the Boffmans can attest to this as well, and Shane and Dennis and those that have been coming to the meetup, they would probably agree seems right now more than ever, especially with the whole pandemic and just what that's done to people's social lives. There's a lot of people in this world, but especially in this community, that are just looking for a place to belong. There are people that are dying to have a family, not just a physical family, but a spiritual family, people that care about them. They want to be loved. And I'm so thankful, so blessed to be a part of the spiritual family here at Kaysville, to have all of you as my brothers and sisters of Christ. But you know what the greatest blessing of all is? That this spiritual family is made possible through the sacrifice of Christ. That he gave himself up on the cross to die, that our sins can be forgiven, that they can be washed away, like Mark was saying before the, uh, the Lord's Supper this morning. That Christ solves our problems. He takes away the sting of death. We have hope beyond the grave. So maybe we have some that are here this morning and you want to be a part of the family of God. Jesus has made that possible for you. Salvation is waiting. So if you are here this morning and maybe you've been studying the word of God and You've come to an understanding that you need to be baptized and have your sins washed away. We'd be more than happy to assist you with that. Maybe you're watching a recording of this later on Facebook or on YouTube and, and you desire to be a part of a family. We'd love to study with you more. Tell you a little bit more about the family here at Kaysville, a group of Christians following Christ. So if you're here this morning, subject to heaven's invitation in any way, we invite you to come to the front as we stand and sing the song select.